to Business Leadership Podcast. In this podcast, I interview successful business leaders and industry experts to help you grow your business. In this episode, I had a discussion with John Lanker, founder and a chief vision officer, and Kevin DePlant, partner and a chief knowledge officer. Lanker is known for delivering high-level creative brand and strategy. Lanker is built on a firm philosophical foundation and on a solid track record of successful real-world result at our highest level. They have been helping business leaders to become that undeniable solution in their market and the brand their audiences know, trust, and love. Lenker's work has been featured in the communication and arts and recognized by American Institute of Graphic Arts. Lenker has grown from a small group of marketers to include a business consultant, analysts, designers, developers, and producers. John Lenker is also an author of Train of Thoughts designing the effective web experience. You know, this was very in-depth discussion on many topics around brand strategy and business growth. Kevin shared his insights on a psychology around the marketing and John shared tactical approach required for strategy execution. We also talked about a brand development when it comes to brand for your customer prospect, also internally for your teams and staff as well. I hope you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. Don't forget to send me your feedback in the comment section. Until next time, enjoy. Hi guys, welcome to Business Leadership Podcast. Today my guest is John Lanker and Kevin DeBlunt. Uh, guys, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for time today. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much for having us, yes. So, you know, your area of, uh, you know, expertise, guys, you know, uh, business is trying to scale back after, you know, a couple of years of disruptions. They're trying to build the companies. Where you see, uh, you know, I don't know who wants to answer. What do you guys see some of the challenges people dealing with, the companies dealing with, or what are some, what are some of the opportunities that they're looking at? Well, I think the the biggest challenge people are facing is is deciding where where do I want to bring my business, or where do we want to bring our business based on the ever shifting ground under our feet as the economy, the world economy, the world, you know, political condition everything you know is is moving so quickly uh, how do you how do you make plans how do you create the smartest possible uh game plan for your business to go forward how do you think about that um you know what are the criteria um you know how do you decide um how aggressive to be in growth you know these are the kinds of things that Kevin and I um deal with every day helping businesses um, kind of plot a course for themselves uh, mm-hmm. into the future. So I, I think this is this is what is on people's minds the most. What am, what am I supposed to be doing anyway with my business? What, what can I even rely on anymore? Everything, all the rules keep changing every other month. So how yeah. do we plan? Yeah, definitely that creates a challenge for business owners. There are people who are trying to scale a company or they're trying to you know build a brand. Um, you know, when when there's so many disruptions in the market, as you mentioned, John, you know, is that the time you slow down on a, on a market or you push harder on that? You know, what are we trying to achieve in, in a company? You know, I see some business owners, they simply say, OK, I'm going to hold on to some of those initiatives. And other ones I see, they want to push through it and push even harder than before because now they want to compete in a market. Well, I mean, the the way to think through that is based on a rational reasoning process, right? It can't just be fear or, you know, um, kind of blind boldness, say, oh, I'm going to go forward and I'm going to succeed, you know, risk it all. No, you know, we'll succeed no matter what. I mean, there's got to be a rational reasoning process. Uh, So, you know, taking a step back, a lot of times we have our instincts, we have our inclinations, we have, you know, emotional energy around what to do, uh, confidence or fear, you know, what is it that we need to think through in order to make the most informed decisions so that we have the smartest possible game plan for right now, for me, based on the the reality of the market that I'm operating in. It's different for every business. It's different for every opportunity. Um, You know, some of the worst economic times become the greatest opportunities for innovators to come in and change the game. And then they escalate while other people, you know, recede. So there is no one size fits all game plan. It really has to do with properly analyzing the market opportunity for your business in your situation. And, and these are the kinds of things that we help people think through very carefully so that um, what is actually set in motion has the highest probability 
of leading you to achieving your goals. So, so is that where the, the the marketing or brand strategy comes in, uh, John? You know that you know if somebody got to build for a business before they start taking on some of those initiatives. Well, you know, um, this is something you know Kevin can can speak to, but um, you know, understanding what a brand is and what its role in your business strategy is is something that needs to be thought through and understood, and. Um, you know, really, when you think it through, everything we do in business is about influencing people to understand, believe in, and take action on something that you're promoting. And and the brand becomes the vehicle through which you communicate and build that belief in your value proposition. So if, you know, no matter what your business is, you're starting from a starting point and you have a destination in mind and in between here and there are many many different audiences with constituents in those audiences that need to buy into something that you're promoting and so the branding is about building that belief so people can say yes to you they can get behind you they can advocate for you they can support you um, and and really getting into the psychology of that and the mechanics of the communication, uh, that's that's something that you know, actually Kevin's an expert in. Um, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that, Kevin. Sure, I think I'll back up. I think uh, so the, because uh, Gurmi, your first question that launched this was about sh- changing waters and shifting environments and. Um, and how do you know, how does a business know whether to stay the course or or change course, right? Mm-hmm. And my first thought of that was that that's where you need to have uh, a disciplined approach to business strategy, where your hierarchy is clear. You've got goals at, at the top of that hi- hierarchy, and they should not be changing mm-hmm. with the shifting currents of the local weather patterns, Right. And then you've got strategies to, uh, or you have objectives to to try to, to you know satisfy those goals that are specific. And then there are strategies, and you can deploy to meet objectives. And then there are tactics that can, are, you know, you have a range of tactics that you can use to implement a strategy. And so, in that hierarchy, there are places where you can move, where you can pivot. That doesn't change an objective or change the goal. The problem is when companies may not have a clear sense of what that hierarchy is and they're confusing um a commitment to a certain kind of tactical strategy for example as being really essentially important to their business goal when it's not you know mm-hmm. so we often when we do our growth consulting with clients we'll look for north star metrics for them if they don't have that the thing that the company is pointing towards and it can be it's a metric that helps them understand uh you know how their performance is aligned with a particular kind of goal but that goal may not be so clear until they sort of really dig deep into the why of why they exist and what they're trying to achieve right Mm -hmm. so that question right away begins a process of identifying who you are as a company, why you exist um, at all. And when you get answers on those, then these other questions about should we p- pivot right now versus stay the course, just get answered much more easily mm-hmm. if you have that clear picture. If you don't have that picture, those questions become very confusing and hard to answer. Very interesting. So where, where the challenge comes from, uh, Kevin, is when you're working in a small company, especially owner is the, the, the person who normally have a goals and they have the plan. When you work in a little bigger company, now you have multiple teams that that have got to define a goals. So where you see some of that, is it on a tactical level that people you know struggle normally or, or is it on a goal level? Where you see some of the struggle and some of the challenges when people trying to build what you just mentioned to, to have built a North Star? Alignment is, is a very hard thing to establish. It's not, it's not, it doesn't happen automatically. It's part of business management practice, right? Do you have alignment? So you imagine your ship and you've got everyone's down and they're rowing with the oars, right? Yeah. But their local oars, the only thing they, maybe it's one or two people have the same oar and they're rowing, but they don't see anybody else because they're in a little closed space. So the, the compartmentalization, right, of the work makes it so that it's easy to, 
maybe not know whether you're rolling in the same direction as some other team member is. And so you need to have an infrastructure in place to uh, be able to monitor and assess and then make changes to things to create alignment around that. And that's not obvious. There are, there are, we have client cases where the, um, the internal organization is such that it's kind of like an octopus. You know, you have lots of these different departments and di different units and have their semi-autonomous. They have their own like brains and their own directives and their own reason for being. And then they're, they're loosely tied together with, with, with a sort of central hub. But, uh, but that makes it such that it can be, uh, they can lose it can be make makes it hard for them to all move in the same direction, and so the leadership struggles with mm -hmm. getting alignment in those in, in those those cases. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Let me let, let me just add something here. So we we work with um, businesses of all sizes. We have clients that you know are multi billion dollars in revenue, uh, all the way to funded startups, and every everywhere in between. And you know, thinking about um, you know the larger entities. Um, I, I'm thinking of two cases in, in my mind. One case, uh, w w again, with a multi-billion dollar entity where the authority granted to the head of marketing for that entity was, was sufficient enough to where that person was able to take action based on the advice that we were giving and working towards. And we've been working with this particular client for a few years. And um, when when you have an organization um, that is diverse and in many departments, um, you know, I'm thinking of another client where the people who brought us into the engagement didn't have any authority. Uh, the people we were dealing with on a day to day basis, they really understood the nature of of um, you know what was going on and and you know our assessment of their situation. Um, but it 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 wasn't able to get percolated up or um, make its way to the top to where the people who have their hands on all the levers really understood. They they hadn't been around for the thought process to a sufficient degree to where they'd internalized the true meaning of of the insights. And so the insights just kind of came at them and you know like water off a duck's back. They just they didn't get it in, in the simplest terms. So I think that um, you know when you're dealing with a much smaller business, usually you're dealing with you know the the founder or the CEO or you know the the, the top management people, um, and and when they're going through the thinking, and when you're workshopping you know the strategy with them, um, they're brought along in the way and and they're able to take action. So I, I think that um, you know the the challenge is when when you go into a situation to make sure that the the people who really have authority to make decisions are brought along through the analysis, through the insights, through the recommendations, so that um, you know we as consultants can kind of tweak and and make things make sense, and and the feedback we get helps you know iterate our insights as well to know mm -hmm. how to how to properly diagnose and guide and create a prescription for that business. Um, so, you know, it, it, it does vary a little bit depending on, on the size of the organization, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, there, there needs to be a set of overarching business goals that are, that are set that make sense. You know, I'll give you an example. There was one kind of mid-tier business that, um, came to us and, and they said, well, you know, we want to have a million subscribers seven months from now. And, and this is for a SaaS platform startup. And we said, okay, well, you know, we have tools and, and, you know, one, one of the simulation tools that we have uh, predicts the capital requirements for achieving a goal like that. Mm -hmm. We said, well, it's going to cost you four and a half million dollars to achieve that. And they're like, well, we don't have four and a half million dollars. We didn't plan for anything like that. Well, in that case, they hadn't planned for customer acquisition at all. They just assumed that, you know, people would see it and like it and everybody would sign up, would go viral. Yeah. Um, so in a case like that, you know, our job is to help them reevaluate what their goal should be based on their ability to, um, you know, uh, act on 
on on those goals in any given moment. So so it becomes very important for us. One of the things that makes us different at Linker is that we're not just focused on you know marketing theory or you know communication strategy. Um, we're deeply rooted in finance. Also, you know, we we look at the financials of a business. We look at um, you know how they're spending their money. We we have benchmarks and and kind of a model for how a an entity should be financially composed at different stages of growth. So mm-hmm. if if something a client is doing is is drastically out of alignment with that model, immediately the bells go off. We see the flags. Okay, you know we need to work on this and and help them understand how things are are not in alignment. They're not going to get where they think they're going to go by following, you know, that strategy or putting those uh, those tactics into place. Um, mm-hmm. So there's, I, I guess the the key takeaway here is when your whole business is at stake yeah. and, and, and everything is on the line, thinking through things properly is paramount. Mm-hmm. It is the most important thing. And few businesses um, are getting access to the benefit of having outside experts look at their situation and, and turning the lights on and putting a magnifying glass mm-hmm. onto the current incarnation of their, of their strategic plan. Yeah. And by, by bringing in people to, to help, uh, you know, filter that and, and, and put a, a quality control on that. Uh, it, we, we find that, you know, our whole business is based on the idea that, that we can really add value there. Yeah, that, that piece you mentioned, John, that's so, a very critical point you just made on a thinking it through. Uh, you know, most business leaders, like including myself, we all come from technical backgrounds. We don't, you know, we, we're not going to identify, we're not going to be able to identify all that, you know, our blind spots or or we don't, we're not expert in a marketing or any any of those those areas. So that's where we need a people like yourself or, or, or you know, who can identify some of those blind spots and get people to think it properly instead of just trying to make those mistakes, I guess, right? I think... I think that's why, you know, if you mentioned that, you know, thinking it through properly, that's very critical. I think that's where its strategy starts in my mind that, that, you know, so what do you think the mindset is, you know, somebody, you know, business owner, the business leader who are watching, if they want to start building and, you know, and start thinking about scaling the company, building a brand, what's, what's the mindset they got to have so they can, they can go out and get the help they need so they can be thinking properly instead of uh, just, just thinking in the short-sighted way to, and trying to grow the company. Well, I think at the at the core of it is understanding that no matter how big the scale of your business, whether it's small or one of the biggest companies in the world, transactions always come down to individuals where you are in influencing an individual human being to say yes to you about something, right? Mm-hmm. And one of our fatal flaws in as humans, is that we we make many assumptions about how we should be interacting with people at any given time in our relationship. Um, I'll give you a, an example: dating. Okay. <laughs> people are notoriously bad at dating. You know, it, it's almost funny because people will go on a first date, and the vast majority of people talk about things on that first date they should never be talking about. Yeah. And they end up making themselves look kind of stupid to the other person, or they scare the other person off because they don't understand the stage of the relationship they're in. And they don't understand what the gateway is to move from that stage of the relationship to the next stage of the relationship. Hmm. And so if you think about your business as, as this vast array of relationships, and each of those relationships is an occurrence state of being that you want to evolve into a higher state of being. You want to get closer to people. You want to build trust. You want to do transactions and and make those more consistent. Uh, You want people to have a good experience working with you so that they tell others and that they want to do more transactions with you. How do you do that? And, And for us, the key is to have a framework for understanding how you assess a person's place in the relationship with you. What's, what stage of the relationship are you at? And what is the gateway between the stage you're in and the next stage? 
And what is it that needs to happen in the mind of the audience member you're targeting to make them say yes to you to go to the next stage? So going back to dating as an example, all right? Yeah. So if you're if if you're on a first date with someone, if you really think about the stage of the relationship you're at, you're in the first date relationship. It's going to last three hours or something like that. It's a very short stage of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what the outcome you're looking for is, it can tell you a lot about the tactics that you should use to get to the next stage, right? If you know that the goal of the first date is to get them to say, you know what? I really enjoyed my time with you. I would love to go out with you again on a second date. Mm -hmm. If you know that is the goal, that's the only goal is to have them have an experience where they say, wow, I had a great time tonight. I would love to do this again. If that's the only reaction you're looking for, immediately you can push away so many things that you would talk about, so many things that you would say, so many behaviors you would you would um, mitigate and, and, and push away from you and, and focus on the things that will just simply lead to that experience, right? And in mm -hmm. the same way, going from that next stage all the way through marriage or whatever the goal is ultimately is a business. It's the same. You've got a certain a condition to the relationship with any given audience member right now. And if you haven't defined what is the what is the um, the milestone, the relationship milestone you're trying to reach, if you don't know what that is, how can you properly think through the the tactics and the strategies around moving them to the next place? Mm -hmm. So in from from relationship milestone to relationship milestone as you get closer and closer, thinking through the sequencing of what you should expose your audiences to, understanding their psychology at each given moment, um, and then being able to guide them properly to that next relationship milestone. Um, thinking through that is something that most people with a technical background, maybe the, an engineer who started a business based on their technical knowledge, they maybe don't understand how to create a, a pathway that people can follow that leads them into that, that greater and greater proximity to you, you know, the, the closeness that will lead to maximize customer lifetime value. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's that makes sense. <laughs> you know, definitely, you know, coming from technical background, I know with business owners that we get a lot of, uh, you know, uh, pressure. We, we, you know, we always skip all those steps, right? And I'm guilty of doing that as well. In a moment, I have a first engagement with a client. I just want deal closed, right? I just want that, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, the, the whole, the deal to be closed, right? So you're missing all the steps. Definitely. I made so many times those mistakes. I'm sure a lot of people made those mistakes, but what you just mentioned that, you know, going step to a step by step uh, approach and then then meeting, to, uh, moving towards your goals, whatever the relationship goal is, is that same approach applied to the customer journey as well? Yeah, I mean, it is the customer journey. I mean, the customer journey is that sequence of events that people, you know, within the sequence, you are interacting with people and, and there's an outcome you want to of every interaction that you have. And so really the customer journey is just a sequence of interactions that build upon one another. And if you haven't mapped that out, if you haven't thought that through, we call that flow path development, you know, at Linker. If you haven't thought that through, what is the, what is the sequence of, of interactions that must occur to move that person into the place that you want them to be? And and how do you think through that? How do you map that? Let, let me give you a, an example that'll be more resonant to your audience. I think um, I talked about dating. Here's another one, raising money, raising money. Most, most people in business have at some point had to go and pitch their business and try to get an investor to say yes to them and, and to invest. Yet the vast majority of people who, you know, think of how hard you have to work to get the meeting with a person who could really make an impact on you if they invested, how yeah. hard and rare that is. But then when we get to that meeting, we so often blow it because we talk about the wrong things. We, we talk about things that are interesting to us. Yeah. And we don't talk about things that are interesting to that potential investor. The, the, the classic mistake 
that is made is that the is that the founder feels like it's important for that investor to know all about the technology and understand all the details all that makes it unique and different and they spend 80% of their time trying to explain how it works and the investor is sitting there going i don't care about how it works i need to know why i should care about learning the details and and the most important thing that you can do when you're in that moment is helping that investor believe that you have something that they could make a massive return on their investment with. That's what they want to hear. If they get the scent of, wow, you know, that there is an opportunity here. I could really see myself making money on this. If they get that trigger, that instinct, if that, that flare comes up in their being, now they'll become curious. They'll say, hey, send me your white paper. Send me, you know, the, the details about your technology. And then they'll go and they'll put the energy in to absorb it because they'll want to validate, you know, what is it, the substances that that will help me realize um, this, this idea I have that I can make money. Mm-hmm. And because, because so few people are tuned into that, they they end up wasting their opportunity. The 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 investors, their eyes glaze over. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in. They they cut it short because you haven't inspired them to believe that you are providing an opportunity for them as an investor. So that's an example of how there's an interaction in a moment in time in a boardroom somewhere where you're pitching, and the goal isn't for them to give you money. That's not the goal of that pitch. The goal of that pitch is for them to become intrigued enough that there actually might be something to what you are bringing to the table that they become motivated to want to dig in and learn more. That's the only goal because nothing's going to happen in that meeting. What's going to happen is they determine whether they want to take the next step. And so that that's the kind of training and thinking that we try to bring into focus with our with our clients is to help them understand where they're at in the relationship with any given audience, understand what is the relationship milestone you're trying to get to in that moment. Mm-hmm. So you can pass to the next one and the next one and the next one by, by breaking that down into its component parts, into a sequence of interactions, understanding what the goal is, helps you craft an experience where the message is on point because you understand what the outcome is, the micro outcome, not the big picture outcome, mm-hmm. but the micro outcome. And to have the patience to, to follow the game plan to get them there. If you properly assess an audience member, you understand what is going to be that path they need to follow. And then make sure you map that, that path out and make sure that you have a, an answer that will lead them to say yes to you at each successive stage of the relationship. Mm-hmm. Kevin, you you could probably elaborate a lot on this. I've given kind of a framework. Maybe you could share a little bit about the qualitative aspects of of what builds that belief and that understanding. Um, well, um, you know the elements. People talk about wanting to build relationships in business where people know, like, and trust you, right? Mm-hmm. Know, love, and trust you. So you think about. What are the what are the experiences that you want to have where people walk away thinking, I really like that person. I felt a connection with that person, or much like lo- lo- love is a strong one. Love, love is a, is one that you get to over time. Like, uh, yeah. gosh, I love that. But yeah. liking is something you can get quickly. Trustworthiness is you know think about what what are the conditions under which we walk away feeling that person's competent. They know what they're talking about. They seem reliable, all these different things. Now, there's a lot of psychology involved in this. Um, but um, but there are uh cues that people respond to that are kind of obvious, you know. Um, and we have, and they're just common sense, most most of them, but the goal of creating experiences that is often it's easy to forget that when you're designing a product or service and then the customer ex- you know interacts with that. You want them to have experiences in which not only do they get some functional benefit uh, out of it, but they walk away feeling um, uh, elevated or made progress towards their other life goals 
um, or or they've had something where it's memorable. So we talk about relationship management where our goals are things like being remarkable, being noticed, being memorable, being comprehensible, being such that they understand what's going on. They have a grasp of, of, of what you're trying to do and what their role is within it. If they're confused by what they're supposed to do or what you're doing, what you're offering for them, that's a problem. You want to be believable too, which Mm -hmm. means that you, you want it so that they feel that, um, what you say and do has the ring of truth to it. Um, and you can back that up, but also it, 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 you, um, it comes along with the way in which you, you present yourself. Social proof is important. Evidence-based reasoning is important, but also the character of someone can really shape whether they come across as believable or not. You want to be, um, unique. You want to be, something that stands out. We talk about being undeniable so that the value proposition that you offer should be such that it's so kind of transparently obvious that this is valuable, that it's like, of course, of course, that's useful to me. Of course, that's the thing that solves the problem. And you're looking for experiences that have that character to them. It's sort of, of course, aha, that sort of feeling of, of, um, of understanding, of grasping it, right? And you want to, and people also now, especially younger people, want the relationships they have with their businesses to be not just functional, useful, but they reflect their character. Like young people yeah. want to relate to brands that they feel are worthy of their patronage, of their. So, what you stand for as a brand is also important to the ideology that is associated with your product or service here. Um, mm-hmm. So creating all those interpersonal moments, those psychological moments is actually the foundation for sustainable brand development, frankly. That's the mm-hmm. way brands are built. And when you when you have that, when you are able to pull that off, the outcome, the byproduct is that people come to associate your name or your symbol or your logo with a set of positive associations. Mm-hmm. Boom, it can, the name alone can conjure up these feelings of trust, respect, passion, engagement. Um, it's its a kind of magic, right? When you see, I just see the logo and my gosh, I have such affinity for that brand that all of a sudden I'm excited about what's going to happen next with them. I want to be a part of that. That's brand magic, right? Wow. And designing that, the key, the, that, that designing that is all about what John is describing as the taking the customer journey and architecting the experiences in an intentional way so that you are building up these associations one moment at a time, cumulatively. Mm -hmm. But there has to be an overarching structure to it. You have to have a brand identity. Like there has to be a story, a narrative that ties it all together, that makes it all part of one thing, a distinguishing identity that makes you different from some other brand, some other competitor. So the other part of it is like this sort of, I talked about, you know, the ideology around your brand. It's the story about why you exist and why you're there and, you, and why you're there in the life of your, of your audience. That's a distinctive story. And if you can tie all those things together in a distinctive story, then all of a sudden it hangs together. That's when you have, that's when you have the brand magic, when the mere name and the logo or the thing conjures up attitudes, feelings, behaviors that dispose the the market. You can influence the market itself just by your brand image can shape behavior in a commercially relevant way. That's the power of brand. Uh, And, but it takes a long time to develop. It takes time to develop and it's based on the foundation are these moments of interaction, moments of engagement that are embedded in the customer journey. So that's when we do brand strategy, we think about, you want to know what your Objective is for sure. You want it. You have to build a machine that's going to help engineer and deliver these experiences for sure. But then, what you're really doing in between is design is experience design, mm-hmm. designing experiences through your product and service and platform. And things that you're that's what you're doing there. So it's a bit like doing art in the sense of like making a movie, for example. You've got all the technology, the CGI and the filmmaking and the audio and the video and the technical ability. You need all that to make a movie. What you're, what you're going for is an experience of an audience member in the seats 
when they are presented an experience of a certain character, someone has to have their eye on that ball, right? That's the experience designer of in the movie making thing. For brand development, you need someone on their with their eye on the ball in the very same way, where they're paying attention to the experiences that the audiences are having. And then be you can and monitor that and measuring that in, in its own way so that you can direct the technical person to say, you know, your product is not is not delighting your audience the way it could, or it's not satisfying a need that that they could, and they're feeling unsatisfied or unfulfilled. So, you know, it's a it's a lots of people have to be involved, just like making a movie, but someone has to be, there has to be someone who's who's uh, got the the audience centric perspective in their head and is helping to shape the um, the product and service development and its delivery and distribution in ways so that you are fulfilling the promise of your brand in that experience every time every time it's a hard thing to do but it's worth it because yeah, if no. you have a brand that works like that there is um there's no more valuable brand business asset than a brand that works like that for you there's just nothing like it right yeah very you, powerful um, when you when you can align all those items together it's very powerful yeah. it's like magic a any any brand you think of that is doing the right things by by when you're building a trust and customer service any any brand you can think of that that, that is doing the right way well i mean let, let's just take a step back and I'll answer that question, but I, I want to just kind of summarize a little bit of what Kevin said, because I, I think yeah. people need a model of, of what has been said here to, to walk away with. You know, a brand is what people believe about you. Mm -hmm. That's what a brand is. A brand is the real estate you occupy in the minds of your audience members yeah. where they hold a belief about who you are, the value you bring. So when you, when you think about it that way, and you think about the experiences Kevin's talking about. Um, now, you know, you may have gone to the gas station this morning to fill your car up with gas and everything went well. Yeah. You, you got the gas, the pump worked, you paid a, a fair price, you had a good experience. But then you go on with your day and, and you've forgotten about it because even though it was a good experience, it wasn't a notable experience. There was nothing notable that would make it stand out that you would tell somebody later. You know, about, you know, I went to the gas station, everything was fine. And then I went, I got my car, I was driving away. And the clerk ran all the way down the street and said, sir, you left your change on the counter here, $6 or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, that is notable. The, the guy could have put the money in his pocket, but instead he chased me down the road in the cold to get, now that I had a good experience, but I also had a notable experience. Now, if you have enough of those notable experiences with a brand, at some point you cross a threshold in your mind where you say, you know what? That brand's remarkable. That mm -hmm. is a remarkable brand because you've had enough positive experiences that are notable. And what do I mean notable? Notable in that amongst the competitive landscape that this brand stands head and shoulders above the rest, right? Like it's like being taller than everyone else. You just stick out something mm -hmm. notable, not just a pleasant experience, but a series of events where you took note of the, dis the differentiation that that brand has brought to the degree that you start to believe they're a market leader, that maybe they're the undeniable solution in the market and that they're the i can come to love that brand and support that brand they stand for something that resonates with me and that's how brand develops goodwill and brand equity and brand loyalty and of course there are many brands that have done this that have represented ideals right mm -hmm. when you buy an apple product you're not buying a piece of technology or a platform you're buying an ideology you're buying, that's why they, a lot of people say Apple's like a cult is because people are buying into an ideology of experience and, and design and, and making things that just impact us at the next level beyond just what the practical inner workings of the technology do. Um, you know, uh, Nike uh, is, it, it doesn't, it's not just a, you know, Nike is just a marketing company. I mean, they don't even manufacture their own their own apparel and, and footwear, but 
what they did a great job doing is making people believe in a overarching ideal, which is that I can, I can transcend, I can take flight. I can transcend the obstacles in front of me and overcome them by just doing it, by just deciding, you know, their tagline, just do it. You know, um, it, 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 it's about an ideal. Mm -hmm. And so the brands that are the strongest in the world aren't just noted for, you know, they do what they say they'll do. That it's, it's great quality. You know, it's, it's a fair price. Those aren't the great brands. There are many companies that fit that, you know, basic criteria. The ones that are the most powerful and have the most value are the ones that tap into sort of the, the collective unconscious of what is driving people and what they're yearning for and that it it provides an avenue through which they can pursue their highest goal mm -hmm. and that your brand becomes a partner with them. And, and you think about your brand story, right? One of the things that people are confused about the most is that your brand story is about your company. It's not. The brand story is about your customer or your client, or your subscriber. It's their story. They're the hero in the story. And your company is a supporting cast member in that story. And the reason they want you in the story with them is because you're helping elevate them as they pursue their goals in life, that you're giving lift under their wings to lift them up. The brand storytelling is the story of your customer and your client and your subscriber and your constituent, it's their story and how you play into that story to lift them up and accelerate their progress. And, and these are the things that lead to a powerful brand where it's an ideology that has very specific components that are remarkable and that are mm -hmm. because they're notable on a consistent uh, basis and the experiences are valuable to the people that are consuming what it is that you're uh, promoting. So all of these things mm -hmm. are necessary to think through and get and, and take command of in order to bring your business to a place where it achieves its goals, understanding how to set the goals, understanding the audiences that you're influencing, understanding the, 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 proper stages of the relationship that they must go through psychologically to get to the place you want them to be to maximize customer lifetime value. And then architecting um, the, the experiential components at each stage of the relationship that are designed to help them easily pass through to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. Mm -hmm. So it's business planning, it's understanding your financial capacity, prioritizing, budgeting in order to maximize the war chest you have to deploy in the uh, service of advancing the goals of your audience members mm -hmm. and showing how you become that, that tool that they can use to get to the destination that they want to go to. That's, that's what we help people think through uh, in our consulting practice. So so that's great, John. But is that any different than building internal brand for your employees? Uh, we're in a competitive market. Everybody wants to build a brand for their, to the teams as well. Is that any different approach or is it a, uh, both the same, how you build the internal brand for, for, with your, for your staff? That's a great question. And I'm going to let Kevin answer it, but that's that's exactly the right way to be thinking. It's the right one. It's the right one. There's, um, I mean, there there's lots of overlap, right? Because you've got, your your company's brand identity is going to be the thing that helps to structures structures the experience of the product and service that you're you know the messaging that you're you're sending out into the world. You want to have your employees to have a um, an experience where they feel like they're part of that brand uh, vision. Um, but of course, the experience of working for you is not the same as the experience of using your product or service. Right? It's th those are two different things. So. This is where things like your brand values and your brand uh, persona help to um, figure out what it is about your internal culture that's that you want to mm -hmm. sort of lean into. 
to, so you want something that's consistent. So the, the, you want the experience of your employees to be consistent with the higher level brand ideology, right? The one yeah. that the world is experiencing as well. So if, if your brand is playful and you create cool products and stuff, then you would expect the internal culture of, of the work environment to be cool and playful and so forth. And you, you would be weird if it was really the opposite of all that. Uh, but the uh, the tool set so for um, creating that kind of brand cult internal culture is somewhat different. You've got some of the same tools, your own your mission statements and your vision statements and your value statements that you go up there and the things that you the slogans you 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 say to yourself and to your audiences. They can also be shared with your internal team. But really, what you have is a set of behavioral practices internally to a company. So you, let's say you have a brand value, you know, we value creativity, whatever. And so the question is, well, what does that look like internally? If you have a brand, if you know, a brand that values that, then what do, what are the behaviors, the, the actions from the leadership, from the management and from the employees that uh, will be are the behavioral expression of that value, like opportunities yeah. for greater work and so on. You can just go down that list, and then and then you have to have, um, in order to you know sort of fulfill a brand culture kind of initiative, you've got to get, um, you know, champions at different levels of your hierarchy. You've got to get champions at your leaders at the ground level leaders at the middle level and leaders at, at the at the upper level to be stimulants to be initiators to be supporters um and you have to have this combination of top down policy things that enact the brand culture but also bottom up organic things like a friday night game night that the employees um develop on their own or a thursday night drink you know or a culture like that or is something that can be really valuable because you it's reinforcing camaraderie, identity, belonging to the brand that the top down didn't mandate. It happened organically. Mm -hmm. um, you want to have this alignment between top down things like the company picnics or the or the other group activities and things that are mandated, and then the organic stuff that comes up and they have to meet and make sense together. It's all kinds of tricks that people do. There are people who do consulting around internal brand culture development. They have a whole list of tricks. Uh, and I think the recurring theme I hear from those guys who, who work in that field is that it can be awfully hard because businesses can be dysfunctional in ways that families can be dysfunctional. And you can sort of, from the outside, you can sort of see the dysfunction there. And you know with the work that it can take to get the family dynamics to change. Mm -hmm. in a way that's really positive trend it can take time and it can be a bit painful and frustrating and so companies can experience the same the same issues you you should be very happy to be working for a company where it feels like the family dynamic is like the culture is like a family that seems to be accountable responsible empathetic and looking for opportunities to to improve all all, all the time if you've got that going on you should be you should be grateful John, no, John wanna, has a point. I just yeah. want to piggyback on that. I want to, you know, Kevin, Kevin is getting into a lot of the, uh, the, you know, the tactics and the, you know, the, the specific ideas that kind of fill in the picture, but at a framework level, it's just important to understand that your employees or prospective employees are, are a, a discrete audience, right. That, um, that you need to think about with a unique set of motivations and needs and that the customer journey, so to speak, that you architect for those audiences, existing employees, prospective employees, it's an audience. There are stages to the relationship you need to think through. There are uh, relationship milestones you need to pass through and to, to bring them into a place of, of kind of positive flow where they're productive and they're, they're functioning and they're excited and can, and their motivation is continuously reinforced. The, the infrastructure around that is very real and specific and, and very 
often it's the case that businesses don't take time to think through their employees as an audience. They don't think through their needs. They don't think through the market opportunity as an employer so that they can understand how to attract the kinds of employees that they want to um, uh, gather and, and keep. So at sort of a framework level, employees are just another audience, mm-hmm. right? Just like your customers are an audience, just like potential investors are an audience. Um, and even, you know, from a public relations standpoint, the community around you is an audience. If you haven't thought through the place you want to bring the supporting community, you know, Steve Jobs famously has built one of the most unique uh, corporate headquarters in the world. It look, looks like yeah. a big alien spaceship. But before he died, one of the last things he accomplished was convincing the city council in Cupertino to allow him to build this. And he he personally showed up. He didn't send delegated. He personally showed up to pitch to the city council and to the people who were the stakeholders, the people of the power to say yes or no to him. Mm-hmm. And he 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 understood all of the mental checkboxes that they would need to go through to become supportive, to become advocates for his vision, to get behind him. He took it seriously. If he had mm-hmm. been presumptuous and, oh, they're just, you know, they don't matter. Yeah. If he hadn't put his full attention to ensuring that he reached his goal, he may have fallen short and he may have offended people to the degree that they dug in their heels and they stood against him and and, and made it impossible for him to accomplish what he wanted to. So understanding, you know, your, your, your customers or clients or constituents or subscribers, um, you know, they're an audience, your investors are, and bankers even are an audience um, you know, your prospective employees, your existing employees, their family members often are an audience because they influence people. Hey, you should stay with that job. That's been good to you. Yeah. Right. The community. Um, and and sometimes they cross as well, John, as you mentioned. So your employee could be a consumer of your product as well. So if you're telling different story as as a as a you know employee experience and you're telling a totally different story as a as as a you know customer experience. And if there's a, some sort of conflict in those stories, that could push back as well, right? Those two of them, as I'm hearing that, uh, you know, as I'm understanding, they get aligned together. So, you know, they they, they complement each other. Yes, but there is another aspect of this. Okay. Um, and I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with Kevin. Um, in, in, at a fundamental level, if you've, I think you said it, it's a fun, happy, you know, kind of, um, you know, if, if if your company makes games like you know Candy Crush or something, you know, and and you know what is it like to play the game and all the colors and you know blah blah, blah. it's you know, but when you go to work every day, you probably don't want employees who just want to sit around and frivolously use their time and oh you know bouncing off the wall. You need people who can focus on writing lines of code and who are mm-hmm. disciplined and who've got certain qualities and characteristics. So on the one hand the actual daily experience of being in the building in that corporation may not feel like playing those games, but the overarching values that that game is trying to support, which maybe I I picked the wrong example because I can't think of what those values might be game candy crush, but, um, but those, the overarching values should be the same thing that people are, are kind of pinning their hopes on when they're working every day really hard towards the goal. Um, You know, uh, films, the film industry is famously difficult, especially for technical people. I know a lot of people in the film industry who do 3D effects. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a very grueling job that doesn't pay as much as you think. And what motivates people to stick with it and want these jobs and compete and fight for these jobs to work long hours, to get paid low wages, to probably be underappreciated that if the minute that you screw up, there's 10 other people who will take your place. What motivates them to want to even be there? It's because they've bought into the vision. They want to work on Lord of the Rings or Star Wars. They want to be a part of that that idea. They want to be associated with it. It it means something to them at their core. They're Mm -hmm. willing to make sacrifices to be there. So in in the thing that I'm kind of hanging on to with what Kevin said is, 
is it's, it's that fundamental value system that people want to buy into, whether they're an audience member wanting to go to see Star Wars or the technologist who wants to work on the movie. At the core, it's a very similar thing that makes them want to be there. But the the capabilities and the qualities and the characteristics of the people on the job, the nature of day-to-day life on the job may not feel like that grand adventure. It may feel like a grueling set of tasks that need to be done on a deadline for low money. Mm-hmm. But the the brand itself is strong enough that it attracts everybody wants to be a part of it and be associated with it and make those sacrifices. How do you build that kind of energy um, so that it becomes a lever inside a person's brain to motivate them to want to go forward with you? Yeah. That's the art and the science and the magic of of branding. Well, very interesting, guys. Very, you know, very interesting discussion. Learn so much from you guys. Um, you know, business leaders who are, you know, like myself, you know, end of the year, we're looking for next year, we're building our, our plans, what are we gonna do. Any any word of wisdom you want to leave for them, uh, John? You know, where can they or, or Kevin, you want to jump in? Where can they start if somebody hasn't worked on it? You know, uh, where can they start? I know I've, a lot of business colleagues I'm I'm look, you know talking to they looking to uh, you know build their plans for 2024, building a strategy. How can they use your help and 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 uh, any word of wisdom you guys want to leave for them? Well, I mean, I'll just say that if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. Yeah, do something new <laughs> and get something more. If if um, if you don't have the will to create space for yourself to properly think through your game plan and have a rational reasoning process that has led you to the game plan that you're planning to execute on, if you if it's not important enough to make a space to think through it properly, you you can't complain too much when random destructive things happen um, as a consequence. So. Um, you know, our advice is take, create a space for yourself, especially this time of year, right? Things are winding down as you're getting you know, loading up for next year. Take the time to, to create a game plan and have a, have a scientific approach, a rational reasoning process that leads you to create the game plan you create. And, um, and if you don't do that, you'll sell yourself short. We help people Go through that kind of a process. If people want to learn more about us, they can go to our website, lenker.com, L-E-N-K-E-R.com, slash Gramit Judge. You got and it. Have some special information. So just yeah. lenker.com slash Gramit Judge, and, and we will uh, create an opportunity for um, your audience members to, to potentially connect with us and, and have a discussion. I'll include a link below the video, John, on that. Kevin, you want to add something to it? Sure. Well, I'm just going to throw in my my um, psychology spin on on uh, John's uh, vet value proposition here. One of the things that uh, Daniel Kahneman, the famous uh, cognitive psychologist, uh, e- economist, founded the field of behavioral economics. He was famous for articulating these different biases that human beings are prone to that cause us to make systematic errors in judgment all the time. And one of them is like the planning fallacy is like we overestimate how things, how much things are going to cost and uh, how much work is going to be systematically. And there's a whole host of these biases that are often anchored to the fact that we're running sort of into relying on our internal intuitions about how the future might go for us, you know, forecasting the future. It seems I, but it seems ideal conditions that nothing bad is going to happen. You have this sort of script about how you want it to be that can you you envision it, and then when it doesn't go that way, it's like surprising. So the, one of the approaches that he recommends is is to take the outside perspective, the external perspective. You're sort of trapped in your internal perspective. The outside view is to ask someone who has gone through the same things that you're going through and say, here's our situation. How similar is this to situations that, that you've experienced? And then look at the outcomes, how things went, go in that sort of set of extra of examples. That becomes the baseline against which you should set your expectations, you anchor your expectations. One thing that consultants can, can offer a business is that we have this host of experiences with a range of companies. 
So we have this date set of, of cases, and then we can compare the, the case of the client with the set that we have. And we can say, I, I think in most cases like yours are going to end up like this because they have, right? Yeah. So you get this perspective that otherwise is very difficult to access if you're just working on your own internal model of how things you think should be going. So that's my pitch for some of the value of consultancy is that it gives you access to the external point of view, which has a debiasing effect and will improve the quality of your judgment and reasoning and uh, decision making. Yeah, no, that, I, you know, I could uh, agree with that more, uh, Calvi. You know, that is, you know, we work in isolation as a business leaders. We can, you know, one way of doing that is, you know, uh, trial and error, you know, do a little bit, make a mistake, learn from it, move, keep moving forward, right? So definitely you're going to waste a lot of time, a lot of money, and, you, you know, hopefully you'll get somewhere where you want. But otherwise, you know, definitely work with somebody's expert, somebody experienced, so if somebody has exposure to the market and they can guide you, you'll get there much faster, um, I know, compared to any other options you, you can think of. So, yeah, and, and most business leaders, I know, we all come from technical background. We're not expert in this area. This is an area we need all the help. But I want to acknowledge your time, guys. You know, I, I know it was a great discussion. I learned so much from our discussion. And uh, business leaders who are watching or listening to us uh, on, a, on a podcast, I will definitely recommend reach out to you guys, have a discussion with you. And, you know, who knows where the discussion is going to take. But, you know, just reach out and have a discussion. And, you know, I learned so much. I'm sure everybody who, uh, you know, connect with you guys, they're going to take away something from a discussion and, and see what the business can take. Well, thank you so much for having us on your on your podcast and your show, Grameet. Thank you. What's the best way for people to connect with you guys? Is there a website? Um, I'm going to include a link to below the website. Any other way they can connect with you guys? It is lenker.com, L-E-N-K-E-R.com slash okay. Grameet Judge. And uh, link, your LinkedIn page, should I include the link below that as a, or the LinkedIn page as well? Or just the website is the right way of connecting with you guys? Um, yeah, we have a contact form on our on our website. Beautiful. And um, there'll be, if people come to that URL, um, Kevin and I will always have a little discussion about our time with you. And so they'll get maybe a little extra as as we share some thought. There'll be a video of us exchanging some ideas on on how our time with you went so they'll get a little bit more and, and there'll be something they can download and um you know that's that's what we offer there at that link beautiful thank you so much for time guys thank, thank you, you so much, much for me thank you